Good evening and welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us for this public hearing tonight and taking the time out of your evening. Uh, this is a public hearing for an Eagle permit application for the Sanford Dam restoration in the village of Sanford, Midland County. Um, my name is Ryan Blazik. I'm with Eagles Environmental Support Division. Just going to be helping to moderate this hearing tonight uh, and kind of explain how this is going to work. So first off, I'm going to go through the agenda. Uh, doing the introduction, uh, that's what we're doing right now. And the big thing to keep in mind is there's actually two separate parts of this hearing. We're going to start off with an informational session. Uh, the Four Lakes Task Force is uh, has an opportunity to describe the project. And then we're going to follow that up with a question and answer session. And we should be wrapping that informational session up at around 630 um, or earlier if there aren't many questions. Um, and then we're going to go through the ways to submit an official comment, and that includes making a statement for the record tonight, which is the second part. So the second part, you'll have an opportunity, and everybody here will have that opportunity to make a statement on the record for this project and application. And then in case there are additional questions, I'll let you know uh, who to contact with further questions, and that's kind of uh, how we'll end the evening. Um, also, in case you haven't been on one of these virtual hearings or meetings with us before, all lines are going to be muted during the hearing, so you'll be able to hear us and everything that we say, but we can't hear you. Like I said, you will have an opportunity to, um, to ask a question and make a statement. We'll tell you how to do that later on, uh, but you can submit a question at any time using the Q&A box in your Zoom toolbar. We'll try to answer those questions during the Q&A session before 630 and before we move on to the hearing part. And then also, just so you know, we are recording this hearing. It'll be on our YouTube channel in a couple of days. All right, at this point, I'd like to invite our Eagle staff uh, to turn their cameras and mics on and introduce yourselves. All right, I'll start it off then. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Mike Size. Uh, tonight, I am the hearings officer, uh, but my normal duties uh, is a regional engineer within the dam safety unit. Oop. Mike, uh, I'm Luke Trumbull. I am the supervisor of the dam safety unit, and we are responsible for um, permitting related to dams and inspection and compliance and enforcement um, for regulated dams in the state. And I'm Jake Brand. I am out of the Bay State District Office, and my job is to review the wetland impacts as long as the impacts to the uh, inland lakes and streams. All right, perfect. Thank you all for those introductions. So at this point, we're going to move on to the informational session. So we have the Four Lakes Task Force representatives on the line. I'd like to invite you to introduce yourselves and uh, begin the presentation when you're ready. I do have your slides here, so just let me know when you want to change them and go to the next slide. And we'll um, try to keep it to around 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, to keep us on schedule. Thank you very much. Uh, that's great, Ryan. Um, I'm Dave Kepler, president of the Four Lakes Task Force, and I'll introduce the other members or they can on the next slide. So I think if you go to the next slide, Ryan, that'd be good. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So the, uh, basically, um, I'll be doing a, a brief introduction and on the Four Lakes Task Force. Um, then we'll have dam design and safety uh, kind of discussed. Uh, the GEI consultants that are on um, who are responsible for the dam engineering aspects of it is Andy Baxter. He's uh, responsible um, and the engineer um, for the Sanford Dam design. Uh, Carlin Grudman is um, the uh, deputy uh, director for GEI and also the dam uh, safety engineer for the project. And then um, we have Ron Hansen, who's the uh, uh, principal uh, from Spicer Engineering, who is our owner engineer, and Steve uh, Rosnowski will be covering the uh, flood study with that to do. So uh, I think you see the uh, folks presented there on, online. So with that, we can go to the next slide. Um, most of the there's a lot of permitting and we thought we'd use this slide. Most of our focus in the presentation will be on the left side, specifically the part 315 uh, dam safety of uh, the environmental, um, natural resource environmental protection action uh, 
part 31 that deals with floodplains. We do have with Ron and others experts uh, available for questions related to part 301, which is the aspects of inland lakes and streams. Um, Four Lakes did go through an alternative analysis to restore the lakes to normal levels. Uh, that had to be documented as a better alternative than um, the current system in this post failure mode. So that was included in the permit. And then as it related to wetland protections, the um, dam construction itself had minimal impact on wetlands. Um, what is unique here is that the uh, proposed work, which will raise the water level, there's approximately 165 acres of wetlands that have emerged um, on the um, on the bottom lands. Um, and when we reach hydrate, we'll have a net of, uh, we'll have a approximately 247 acres returning and being rehydrated in the uh, in the basin area. Uh, this was determined through studies and field working with Eagle, and we're committed to monitoring that to demonstrate that we're going to see more wetlands recover from uh, the dehydration than we did in terms of developing on the land that was a requirement. And for inland lakes um, related to streams, that section uh, we now have um, streams are that are exposed to underneath that were underneath the lake that are now exposed. We have an obligation to develop mitigation plans for that. They include creating a uh, fish spawning area at the tail of the Stanford Dam, uh, looking at um, a demonstration project around the uh, tail end of the dam as well on sediment loading and habitat improvement below the dam, expanding a culvert uh, in the basin, which um, and then also um, developing sh shallow water habitat just south of US 10. So those projects are part of the uh, mitigation programs under Part 301. And so that's what I'm going to cover uh, generally today. There's a lot of other permitting that's not covered in that, but we just put it, uh, these are usually local or federal permitting that was also required that we've gone through and just wanted to summarize that. Uh, with that, I'll uh, pass the dam safety aspects over to uh, Andy uh, uh, on, in terms of the dam design. Thanks, Dave. Uh, you want to jump to the next slide? Okay, so the Sanford Dam restoration, uh, we are looking at the existing or the relic structure, and we're looking at all the elements that are inadequate to meet, uh, you know, current regulation requirements and, and standard of, of dam safety practice. So inadequate spillway capacity, um, there were embankment stability issues, uh, seepage issues, uh, the the base flow was passed through the units and through the uh, through the the gates themselves. So we uh, have the addition of a low level outlet, um, and then obviously that breach left embankment uh, needed to be rebuilt. Um, we'll take a quick look at the new at the new structure and some comparison between the relic structure and and the uh, and the new one. Next slide. So this is the new footprint. Uh, and, a, and a photo looking downstream at the at the primary spillway. As you can see, the footprint follows the, the previous uh, alignment for the dam. Uh, you have components of the primary spillway and a new uh, long 650 foot auxiliary spillway. Uh, between those structures, you have, uh, you have embankment and all of the embankment material on the right side is all RCC overtop protected. On the left side, where you have a short section of embankment, is is heavy riprap protected. Okay, next slide. So our primary design criteria is called the uh, inflow design flood. Uh, this establishes the uh, the may, basically the minimum or the, or the criteria flow uh, that this structure has to pass associated with the storm that manages the risk to the dam safety and to the public. Uh, this risk based approach is consistent with uh, with Basically, all uh, all federal guidelines, including FEMA, CORE, uh, Bureau of Rec, and it also aligns with the state dam safety programs and Michigan's task force on dam safety. The intent is that our design for for Sanford has to meet um, and exceed uh, this discharge capacity that's set by the by the IDF. Okay, next slide. 
So we're looking at here is, is that primary spillway that's next to the, the, the existing powerhouse. And you can see at the top screen versus the bottom screen are the two new, are the footprints for the primary spillway. Uh, you can see the capacity for uh, the primary spillway before, um, uh, for the old structure was 29,700 CFS. And our new spillway, which has a lowered sill elevation, has, has 37,800 CFS at that design flood condition and top of dam uh, or a top of dam condition. So we've, we've, we've added significant capacity just to the primary spillway, not, uh, not including the auxiliary. And we'll talk about that next. Next slide. So we're looking at here's comparison of uh, the pre uh, or the old structure versus the new structure. You can see Sanford Dam on the far right. Uh, we're continuously you know, increasing capacity as we run down the watershed, and you can see the Stanford Dam capacity is, is similar to the Edenville Dam inflow. The outflow is slightly less due to a little bit of storage, and so our intent here at Stanford Dam is to, uh, to pass at least what the Edenville Dam. Uh, the risk-based approach came up with a number that was lower than this. Uh, we increased it to match the Edenville Dam to make sure that the system could all function, uh, uh, function together well. And you can see, once again, your zero free board capacity for your primary spillway is increased significantly. Auxiliary spillway is much higher. And our overall increase is 41,000 CFS versus the old structure. So that's, uh, that's over doubling of the, of the relic structure or the old structure to the new dam. Thanks. Next slide. That might be it. Yep. Uh, Steve, I think you're next. Absolutely. Thanks, Andy. Mm -hmm. So, first of all, just wanted to touch base on a couple definitions. Andy talked a little bit about the inflow design flood, the IDF. I want to talk a little more about floodplains. Specifically, I'll refer to the 100-year floodplain that's regulated under Part 31 of NREPA by EGLE. And when we say the 100-year floodplain, what we mean is the land that's inundated by a flow for a 100-year storm. And that 100-year storm is not just a storm that happens once every 100 years, it's actually a storm that has a 1% chance or a one in 100 chance of happening any given year. So you could have back-to-back 100-year -back storms, but it is the 1% chance storm. And then that brings to the next definition, which is the National Flood Insurance Program or NFIP. This is what FEMA administers uh, when they say the regulated 100-year floodplain. So this is what FEMA is actually regulating. They use this National Flood Insurance Program uh, to enforce the floodplain management for that 100-year storm. Uh, next slide, please. So when we get to the Sanford Dam, uh, looking at the peak outflows, I want to specifically focus on the, the graph here, or the uh, chart here on the right-hand side. And the intent of the Sanford Dam is really to allow the peak flows to pass and match the run of the river situation. So it improves dam safety by essentially letting the flow that comes in equal the flow that comes out. So we, here we've got a comparison of the dams being in place versus the dams post restoration. And you can see from the comparison here that in the 50 and the 100 year storm, the flow, whether the dams are in place or whether the dams are not in place, is roughly the same. Uh, once you start getting to the 100 year storm and slightly above that, you start seeing some attenuation or storage of those higher flows. But for storms up to about the 100 year storm, uh, the dam is being designed to effectively pass the flow just as if the dam was not there. So operate it in a safe condition and allow that flow to pass. Uh, from those storm events. Next slide, please. And then this is just a comparison of a hydrograph. So on the left-hand side, you have the 50-year storm. On the right-hand side, you have the 100-year storm. On the left side, or the, the y-axis of both uh, graphs, you have discharge in cubic feet per second. And on the horizontal axis, you have uh, the storm duration in hours. So the blue lines are with the dams absent and the orange lines are with the dams restored. And you can see with the proposed design on that 50 year storm on the left, 
that those two flows effectively match, uh, and that's intentional. Um, and then on the right hand side, once you get up to that 100 year storm, you do get some attenuation in the peak flows, but generally those hydrographs match. And again, the intent is to allow the flow that's coming in to equal the flow coming out and operate the dams as if uh, it were run of the river. So flow in uh, matches the flow coming out. And with that, uh, we'll go to the next slide. I think that's it for our presentation. All right, thank you all for providing that presentation and information. We're gonna move uh, right into our question and answer session. So if you have a question, you can submit your questions using the Q&A box. Uh, you see that at the bottom of your screen. Uh, just type it in there, or you can click the raise hand icon, which you also see at the bottom of your screen. You can raise your hand, and what'll happen is I'll call on you, I'll unmute you, you can unmute yourself, and you can ask your question verbally. Um, or you can type pound two. If there's people who are on the phone, uh, you can, on your receiver, select pound two. That will raise your hand um, in Zoom, and we'll call on you using the last four digits of your phone number. So with that, we do have some questions uh, coming in. And uh, it would be great if our panelists could turn their cameras uh, on at this point as well. It might just help everybody see who's, who's answering the questions. Um, so the first question, <clears throat> or thank you all. Uh, I have uh, two questions for the Four Lakes team. It says, what is the source of funding and accrual for the maintenance that will be required to maintain all dams over the years? And the second question is, what is the current level of liability insurance for each dam and the source of funding for the liability premiums and what level of liability insurance is for lakes willing to commit to the public for insuring uh, should a fail failure occur um, and that the flood victims are compensated for their losses. Yeah, I'd be happy to answer that, okay, uh, Brian. I, I, Ron, I might need your help on the construction liability coverage. I think it's always covered that. Source of funding and maintenance of uh, the uh, uh, the dams is through an operational and a maintenance assessment uh, that's assessed um, across the, our, the Four Lakes Special Assessment the District. Um, and we are able to, we have that continuing and there's expectations set that we will uh, be spending that maintenance level for kind of forever. And so we manage that with a, a special assessment on maintenance. Um, the other thing, uh, and over the years, I think the other thing I think the community should know is we have done uh, a detailed analysis of all the failure, all the points of repair needed over the next hundred years and feel that the current capital assessment structure that we have, that long-term we have the capability to fund major, you know, major upgrades so the dams don't get behind. Um, the current level of liability insurance related to the dams is uh, more in a construction mode today. I, I would say, uh, just to remember, these are dams that are really county-owned dams, and, and Four Lakes Task Force is the uh, delegated authority. So um, we do carry liability insurance um, in different capacities for the dams as we're constructing them. Uh, but also the count and that capacity is in the $10 million range with construction, some, some a little bit better. And we're looking for more insurance and coverage as we go forward. Um, the dams themselves are, um, as we go forward and, and operate them, are, um, the county has the Michigan uh, Municipal um, Risk Management Association that provides collective insurance across that. And we're looking uh, with Marsh, um, insurance to see what's a broader structure as we go forward and stuff to, to work on. So um, we do have that as an aspect of risk and we're looking at the failure modes and where risk might occur and the liability associated with that um, as we go forward. All right, thanks. Yeah, thanks. And I, I would add to that, Dave, that, you know, during the design process, there was um, significant risk analysis um, you know, going through all of the dam safety processes. And so the, so that was, you know, factored into the design to come up with a dam that reduces, significantly reduces the risk. 
right perfect right. perfect anybody have anything else for that one okay yeah thanks for answering that question um <clears throat> next one i have here uh four lakes this is for four lakes what is your current emergency action plan for the dams you own and how have they been communicated to the residents downstream of the dams in midland yes we're required to have emergency action plans we put them in place um in their current status um they are um reviewed uh Carlin's on the phone. We're, we've got that actively with GDI. They're integrated and we work with both the Gladwin County emergency action uh, managers, emergency managers, and uh, a part of their emergency action plan. So, so those are shared with the um, counties and we integrate into their overall emergency action plans. Thank you for that. And I do have a raised hand here. Um, so, um, Lori Oreo, I'm going to unmute you on our end, and then you can unmute yourself and ask your question to the panel. Oh, hi. Thanks, you guys. Um, what my question, I guess, was just to clarify, is it 10 million of um, liability insurance on each dam? So Edenvale fails, we've got 10 million. Um, Smallwood fails, we've got 10 million. Yeah, no, it's uh, basically there's an overall system number and an overall there's insured as one on construction there on construction. So there's two different models, right? So we're in the construction mode. So there's insurance on construction and those are around the dams. And so those are kind of built for each dam with the general contractor and, and the insurance we expect around that. Um, so that's in the, in the construction mode as we go forward in the um, in the existing um, in the future mode when we're operating the dams at lake capacities and stuff that's managed as one system so there's usually coverage for the counties and then for us in terms of what we determine that on top of that that is um, done for the system and it's usually based for the county on one failure uh, uh, and then a total for that failure if there's other things that get damaged and stuff to work through okay. so um, and then the dam has different structures. So, um, so Gladwin County and Midland County are, are separate. So that they, there's like two insurance things based on where the incident occurs. And so it's fairly complicated. And then certain aspects, um, we're still working with the, uh, you know, there's 2000 dams in Michigan and they're, they're still looking at how to insure them and we're working through that process. Okay, so I guess um, what I'm trying to get to is, first, do you know, you probably do, the total number of dollar losses to Midland with the Edenville dam failure as a whole. Do I? Yeah. I don't have it up. I, okay. I don't want to misquote it, but it's significant. Oh, yeah. It's, I'm sorry. It's significant, but I can't, I yeah. don't, I don't. I don't Right, and I'm not trying to get you on the defensive here or anything, um, <laughs> but just so you know where. Yeah, and I, I think what Ron's point was that we the designs are so we normally look at a failure rate if you think about the failure that happened it was approximately a 100 to 150 year flood at, at Edenville maybe a little bit more uh the design around these are designed um as we saw those frequency rates where they were looking at one in 500 at Edenville we're looking at kind of one in 5,000 uh frequency rates and at the design of this is there's a point where the dams aren't mitigating risk because people think they're, they're not flood control dams but they get to the point where the flooding is the risk and we're basically incremental to any failure there so when you get to a, a 500 year a thousand year flood these dams should still be there and but the reality is the flooding is going to cause more damage than the than the dams will right and i'm sure you probably know um like just so you know my situation is I had over $500,000 damage um, on two houses I own. And so like 10 million of coverage, obviously I would be taking whatever 500,000 out of 10 million is. <laughs> um, and I'm sure you probably know too, I think the, uh, whoever the, I forget their name, Boyce Hydro. That, I think they had that's, like for con that's for construction. It's very hard for a county to get more than and when you get to a major failure, uh, it's very hard for a county or somebody like us to get more than a couple million dollars for uh, 
of kind of insurance coverage. So I don't want I want to set it up when there's a different risk structure when we're doing construction versus operations. And that's why it's extremely important that we make sure the dams are invested in a way that they're not going to have the same failure profile that they did before. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for um. Thanks for the information. And uh, Lori, I, I have another question here from you. Did while you're on the line, did you want to ask that about the five? Oh, I was. I don't want to take up the whole call. <laughs> it's just um. I was curious on the methodology behind the five thousand year flood because all the research I've done on FEMA and National Institute of Dams and all that, like nobody has a five thousand year projection, and I'm just curious how they um grabbed that made that determination um, the methodology they so, used. So I'll try. You wanna you wanna try that a little bit, uh, Andy? Or you want me yep, to I can over? I can do that one here. So this goes back to that IDF that it's a risk based approach. So you're right that that number itself doesn't necessarily appear. Um, what we did here for Sanford specifically is we looked at um, at at basically up through the ten thousand year and beyond. Uh, what uh, at, at each flood condition and a dam failure condition. And what happens at Sanford, since it's be, running as a run of the river dam, by the time you get to the 5,000 year event, there's only about five feet head difference between upstream and downstream. So your downstream area is significantly flooded. If that dam breached or failed at that point, the incremental rise, what's called an incremental, incremental failure analysis, that incremental rise is less than two feet and a less than seven feet per second uh, velocity, which then equates to similar uh, to uh, failure of structures downstream in situation. So basically at that five years and year, 5,000 year event, if the dam failed at that point, it would be uh, very difficult to see uh, any incremental increase in damage at that point. So that's what's happening here at this 5,000 year. At lower levels, um, that incremental rise is greater and would cause additional damage than just the flooding itself from the event. Okay. Uh, and then, you know, keeping in mind that that, combat, that flood event is around 32,000 uh, CFS for Sanford. We did design to match, um, to match uh, Edenville, which is uh, 54,000 CFS. And our overall capacity is 77,000 CFS. So you can imagine we're, we're adding incrementally to that number. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Thank you for those questions. Um, next question is: uh, Should Eagle require the use of an ecosystem approach to determine the best alternative design option, comparing the Boyce Hydro model with gated service spillways versus the Nature Lakes model with fixed labyrinth service spillways for the Sanford Dam permit application? So I'm not sure it's directed at, at Eagle. Um, I guess who, whoever. Can take a step I think it would be would... good if Eagle asked. I think I, you know, having been asked to answer that question many times, okay. I think the question is, uh, Luke um, or Mike, uh, it'd be good if Eagle responded. The question I think is, um, why why do we have um, the primary spillways um, as the why are they primary spillways and why aren't we using the alternate? Um, the auxiliary channel or a, a weir based channel like we're, we've got for the auxiliary, why don't we use that first versus the uh, spill gates? Sure, I, I, I can. Think Andy can answer, but we've answered it several times, so I think it's a question that you might want to answer. Sure, I can. I can take a stab at it. Um, so um, typically we don't make requirements of what a final design looks like. Um. The, the, you know, it's up to the dam owner and their consultant team to propose, you know, design alternatives and, and pick the one that best suits their needs. I think that, you know, with um, different spillway configurations, there's pros and cons for each one, you know, like a, a gated spillway, you can achieve a higher capacity and lesser area. So, you know, the, the size and of the disturbance needed to construct that and the outlet channel and everything that it would be is, is typically more compact. But with a gated spillway, there's more active management that's required in maintenance of moving parts and things like that. Whereas with a fixed crest spillway, such as like a labyrinth spillway, um, 
it's kind of more of a set it and forget it where you can you can let the, the spillway you kind of regulate flows and, and the lake will fluctuate you know with flows um and there's less moving parts but it's you know typically going to be a much larger structure with much more disturbance and and uh uh, maintenance on things like concrete and, and reinforcing steel and things like that. So there's pros and cons to both. Um, I think where your service spillway, if you have a seasonal drawdown versus a, you know, a summer level versus a winter level, it becomes more difficult because a fixed crest is not movable. So you, you wouldn't be able to lower the lake level in winter as easily using that same spillway. Um, so I think I think that you know those are just some general considerations that folks make when they're designing spillways configurations and uh, um, you know we're more concerned at, from at Eagle with the uh, the amount of environmental impacts the safe overall safety of the structure and if the operation and maintenance over time is adequate to meet the you know the both the structural stability component of you know having a dam. But also the the hydraulic capacity and operational adequacy, you know, to to be able to maintain um, the a, a safe dam, but also regulate flows adequately over time. So I think, um, you know, if if it were presented to us, you know, kind of flip flopping using a fixed crest like a labyrinth for for a for a um, uh, principal spillway versus a an auxiliary spillway, we would consider that, you know, and go through the same review. But um, it's not really our place to dictate to to a design professional or a dam owner you know uh, the configuration that that a dam must that must be fair. in i think the other thing which, which there's kind of two words in there the ecosystem and then the dam safety but ultimately our requirement to meet 301 and these others was we had to we're basically going to run at the river and then second of all um we had to stay within the current river structure right we weren't going to you know we had to kind of not create an environment where we're, you know, disturbing too much the rivers we're going down. But maybe I think this is a important enough question that uh, Andy, from a dam safety point of view and from a just a design point of view for this type of dam, why didn't we try to do it the other way in terms of Stanford? Uh, mainly is that we can't pass as much flow. Um, what happens here is that, you know, you look at our sill elevation, which is 614 versus our lake level up at 627. Uh, if we try to maintain a, um, a fixed weir condition all the way across at 627 and a half, that fluctuation would have been significant in order to, that we couldn't have kept the, the lake within its criteria for lake levels at, low, at lower uh, storm events. You would have had a much more flashy system. Similarly, is that our overall capacity would be significantly less. Uh, it's very flat around Sanford. In other words, you know, our, our top of dam elevation, uh, as you can see, we've had to tie it out to adjacent, um, uh, you know, the adjacent road and, and the park. And if we had to go up another couple of feet, uh, we would have gone all the way out to M30 to try and chase that elevation. And so it's very flat in that area. So in other words, if we tried to, we need to maintain and, and keep sill elevations as low as possible to pass all that capacity without uh, going around the river channel, if you will. Good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah, thanks for answering that question. Um, and that was actually the last question that I had uh, up here and it's time to move on. So. Uh, that's perfect timing on our part. Um, but I will be showing uh, who to contact for additional questions in case any questions come up. I'll provide, be providing that contact info uh, after we move on from the hearing part, kind of at the end, end of the evening. Um, so the next part is going hey, Ryan, if I could just before I get off, if, if like Gore or anybody else wants a specific question, um, you know, uh, related to things at Four Lakes and not to the permitting, they can at information at fourlakestaskforce.org, they can contact us if it's related to insurance or, or things like that that are not permitting aspect. Um, we're certainly happy, we continue to be willing to answer questions. All right. Thanks for that, Dave. Um, so, yeah, I guess the next portion is the portion to make your um, next part of the hearing is the part where we're going to make a statement for the record. But before we do that, 
In case you don't want to make a statement tonight um, and want to make a comment by other means, you can also make a comment by my Enviro, uh, Eagles My Enviro permitting database uh, under submission HPM 56M2-CJC9G. Um, and we're going to put this link in the chat so you can make your comments there. You can also do that by me by mail. I'm going to read this in case we have anybody on the line um, on the phone. Uh, Eagle Water Resources Division, Lansing District Office, 525 West Allegan Street, P.O. Box 30473 in Lansing, Michigan, 48909. And the comment period, they would be able to make these additional comments. It's going to be open for 10 days, uh, so that'll be until July 15th. And in case we have to move on and you missed this slide, um, well, we're going to be showing the slide again after the statements are made. So you'll be seeing the slide again. So with that, I would like to invite uh, Mike as our hearings officer to read the opening statement tonight to kick off the hearing part of the evening. All right, thanks Ryan and everybody. Please just bear with me as I trug through this. Uh, so good evening again. Uh, my name is Mike Size and I am the district representative in the Water Resources Division of the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy. And I'll be serving as the hearing officer for this public hearing. Uh, on Eagle submission number HPM-56M2-CJC9G. Uh, and to describe how this is going to work tonight, I will begin with some background information, and then I'll describe the purpose of the hearing and uh, how your comments will be used. So following that, I will outline the procedures under which we will take your comments and then uh, describe what will happen um, after tonight's hearing. After tonight's hearing, excuse me. Uh, it will then be time for you to provide comments and we'll spend the majority of uh, the remaining time tonight listening to those comments. At the end of the hearing, I will then uh, conclude with a brief closing statement. Uh, so by way of background information, uh, the Water Resources Division is, is responsible for administrating uh, a variety of programs that help protect the inland lakes and streams, wetlands, floodplains, sand dunes, and the Great Lakes. These programs regulate certain activities such as dredging or filling a lake, stream or wetland, constructing a dam, constructing a marina, placing shore protection or constructing docks, and building in a designated critical sand dune area, wetland or floodplain. The law governing these responsibilities is the Natural Resources and Environmental Protection Act, 1994 PA 451 as amended. Uh, we are here tonight because Dave Kepler of uh, Four Lakes Task Force has proposed the following. To rebuild the right embankment while extending the existing steel sheet pile cutoff wall into the dam foundation. Install internal filter drainage layers with a tow drain. Construct new auxiliary spillway across the top right embankment comprised of roller compacted concrete. Raise the existing primary spillway sidewalls and extend them downstream. Install new hydraulically operated press gates. Fill the powerhouse with controlled low strength material. Construct a low level outlet right of the press gates to maintain base flows. Flatten the left embankment slopes and install a blanket filter on the downstream side of the embankment. The proposed work will impact approximately 165 acres of existing wetlands and will create approximately 245.7 acres when the impoundment is restored. The proposed work will temporarily impact 4.14 acres and 240 linear feet of Sanford Lake with approximately 22,515 cubic yards of fill material and approximately 6,110 cubic yards of dredge material below the ordinary high water mark. The proposed work will permanently impact 1.08 acres and 622 feet of the Titabawassee River with approximately 27,155 cubic yards of fill material and approximately 7,650 cubic yards of dredge material below the ordinary high water mark. The proposed work will also impact the 100-year floodplain of the, of the Titabawassee River with approximately 34,415 cubic yards of fill material and 26,785 cubic yards of excavation. 
So uh, in order for a permit to be granted, EGLE must find that the proposed activities described in the public notice meet certain criteria set by Part 31 Water Resources Protection, Part 301 Inland Lakes and Streams, Part 303 Wetlands Protection, and Part 315 Dam Safety of Act 451. And in general, the department must consider the effect of the proposed project on the stream and wetlands. So when reviewing an application for permit under the provisions of Part 301 in the lakes and streams, uh, EGLE is charged to make the following considerations as required by Section 30106 of Part 301. The first of which being uh, that the department shall issue a permit if it finds that the structure or project will not adversely affect the public trust or riparian rights. And secondly, that the department shall not grant a permit if the proposed project or structure will unlawfully impair or destroy any of the waters or other natural resources of the state. And when reviewing an application uh, for permit under the provision of Part 303 Wetlands Protection of Act 4, uh, 451, uh, EGLE is charged to make the following indications as required by Section 30311 of Part 303. Uh, first is a permit for an activity listed in section 30304 shall not be approved unless the department determines that the issuance of a permit is in the public interest and that the permit is necessary to realize the benefits derived from the activity and that the activity is otherwise lawful. Secondly, a permit shall not be issued unless it is shown that an unacceptable disruption will not result to the aquatic resources. And thirdly, a permit should not be issued unless the applicant also shows either of the following. The proposed activity is primarily dependent upon being located in wetland uh, or a feasibility and prudent alternative does not exist. So the purpose of tonight's hearing is to give anyone interested in the Sanford Dam restoration project uh, an opportunity to provide information that Eagle can use in making a decision whether or not to issue a permit. So please recognize that EGLE can only use the information you provide if it relates to the criteria that EGLE must use in decision making. So some of you may simply want to express your support or opposition to the project, um, and we'll be happy to take note of those positions, but please understand that EGLE is by law not allowed to base our decision on whether or not there is widespread support or opposition to the project. In just a moment, uh, I'll outline the procedures that we'll use for taking your comments. Uh, but before I do, I need to mention that the notice of this hearing was published in the Midland Daily News beginning on Monday, June 26 of 2023. So uh, in order to ensure that the hearing is conducted in a fair manner, uh, we're gonna follow these steps. First, the applicant um, and consultant have already had an opportunity to describe the project. Secondly, uh, Ryan is then going to call on those who have indicated during pre-registration that they would like to speak in the general order in which they registered. And when all pre-registered attendees have spoken, Ryan will ask if anyone else would like to make a statement. Anyone else who would like to comment, please raise your hand in Zoom and keep it raised until you're called upon. When your name is called, please state your name and any group or association you may represent. As a reminder, if you're participating in this hearing via telephone only, follow the directions uh, of the moderator on how to identify that you would like to make a comment. You may also submit your comments to Eagle, Eagle via my Enviro portal, uh, email, or US mail. Each person will be given four minutes to make their comments. Uh, we will indicate to you when you have about a minute left. Please begin wrapping up your comments and end within your allotted time. And if need be, Ryan will indicate when your time is ended. We ask that all be courteous and respectful to one another tonight. Only one person should be speaking at a time. Uh, please do not interrupt the speaker and please also recognize that Eagle staff is here tonight to provide a, a fair opportunity for you to express your comments on the proposed project and uh, to listen to those comments. So this hearing is being recorded and your comments will be part of the information EGLE will consider in making its decision on whether or not to issue a permit on the proposed project. The public comment period for this public hearing is open for 10 days from the date of this hearing ending on July 15th of 2023. 
additional information and comments uh, submitted in writing during that 10 day uh, public comment period will also be considered in Eagle's decision. So following the closing of the pu public comment period, Eagle will make a decision on uh, whether to issue a permit for the project as proposed or with modifications or send a letter of denial. You may find out uh, what the decision is by checking the Eagle My Enviro portal website and searching for the application number HPM-56 M2 dash CJC 9G. So thank you for your attention and uh, we'll begin uh, calling the names of those who have indicated that they would like to make a statement. All right, yeah, thanks for reading that off, Mike. Um, as Mike mentioned, we have uh, a list of names who indicated during the registration that they wanted to make a comment. I have six people on that list. Uh, so if you registered and wanted to make a comment, I'll read your name, we'll unmute you on our end. And you can unmute yourself and make your statement. Uh, again, you have four minutes. We'll give you a one minute heads up when you about have time, when time is about up for you. Uh, everyone will have a chance to make a statement um, and everybody will have the same amount of time to make things uh, fair. Uh, and then once we get through this list of names, then anybody else on the line who didn't indicate during registration that they wanted to make a comment, um, you can raise your hand in Zoom and we'll call on you in order after we get through this list of names. So like I said, everybody will have uh, that opportunity. Uh, again, if we have people on the phone, they can select pound two to raise their hand. Um, so the first person I have is Kimberly Sedler. Uh, let me see if we can find Kimberly. <clears throat> and she may have some people missing. Are you seeing Kimberly, Caitlin? I'm not seeing oh, Kimberly. No, I'm not, Ryan. All right, thanks. All right, so the next person then would be Lori uh, Oriel. Uh, and then after Lori, it'll be Tim Holsworth. So Lori- yeah, I'll do mine. This is Lori. I'll do mine in the portal. Thanks, though. Okay, yep. Yep, no problem. You're more than welcome to. Uh, so then next up would be Tim Holsworth. And then after Tim is Theodore Hummel. So Tim, let's see here. Yep, Tim, it looks like you are unmuted on our end. Can you hear me okay, Ryan? Yep, we can hear you. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. My name, uh, as you mentioned, is Tim Holsworth. I'm the president of the Sanford Lake Association. Uh, we, we know the community understands the need. Um, and I and I know for a fact we greatly appreciate the diligence and effort of everyone here involved in uh, rebuilding the dam and restoring our beloved lake. And so I just want you to know the association and literally, literally everyone that I've talked to in my community 100% support this project. And that's it. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. Yeah, thanks for your comment, Tim. All right, next up is Theodore Hummel, and then after Theodore is Sydney Hansen. So Theodore, it looks like you're unmuted on our end. You can begin when you're ready. Thank you for taking my call. I live on Douglas Drive, and my concern is not so much the main lake, but when and if some work will be done to deforest Black Creek, which flows into the main lake. Right now we got trees out here that are 14 feet high and I'm not gonna down there myself and cut them out. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your comment. All right. Um, next up, uh, Sydney Hansen, and then after uh, Sydney is Vincent Zanini. All right, Sydney, it looks like you are unmuted on our end. Um, you can unmute yourself. There should be like a microphone icon on the lower left-hand part of your screen you can click to unmute yourself um, and make your comment. And if if you're having if you're having trouble with your microphone, we can go. Oh, there you are. Are you there? Talking to the company right there. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, address the uh, hearing this evening. Um, 
my comments relative to the Sanford Dam are applicable to the uh, Edenville Dam, which will be uh, coming up in the future. Uh, I am a resident on the uh, Wixom Lake. Uh, Wixom Lake uh, has a luxury of almost a mile of embankments. That mile of embankments allows a lot of uh, options to uh, include uh, fixed weirs as a way for uh, flow control. Uh, one of the items that I want to draw attention to is, is that the fixed flows uh, draws attention to the uh, natural lake model. Uh, my opinion is, is that Eagle should be uh, considering how do we make dams in Michigan operate like natural lakes. Natural lakes all work with a, uh, a fixed outlet and have worked uh, fine. Uh, other issues to be addressed with the uh, Wixom Lake uh, model would be, are you really gonna raise and lower uh, levels in a lake and for what meaningful purpose from an environmental standpoint? My contention is, is that raising and lowering the lakes is primarily to, uh, as a weed control, which is, I think, pretty secondary and minor, and is that the next one is to uh, protect the spillway gates and that the spillway gates are uh, will have less wear and tear. So my issue is, is that the alternative should be uh, evaluated and Eagle should be calling for that alternative to hear something in a meaningful way rather than comments and conversation. My, my issues with the uh, Four Lakes Task Force is, is that I've never heard of are never seeing a good written response to how this would work. And again, my attention is on uh, Wixom Lake. But I do appreciate the opportunity to uh, comment. Uh, I do like, want to see the uh, dams that we put in have extended lifetimes, maybe well beyond 100 years, 200 years, 300 years, to where they become just a part of the, uh, the natural uh, water system for our uh, state of Michigan. Thank you for taking my comments. Yeah, thanks for your comments, Sydney. All right. <clears throat> and it looks it looks like our last registrant who indicated they wanted to make a comment isn't going to make one tonight. So at this point, we are going to open it up to anybody else in the audience who hasn't um, made a comment yet. If you would like to make a comment, you can select uh, the raised hand icon at the bottom of your screen. You'll see that hand just raise that, uh, and then we'll call on you. Um, we'll unmute you. You can unmute yourself and then um, give your comment. So, is anybody on the phone? And let me see. It doesn't look like doesn't look like we have any phone in callers. But just in case, you can select pound two to raise your hand as well. Is there anybody else uh, who would like to make a comment tonight? Give it a couple seconds here, and maybe while people are thinking about that, so. For the remainder of the night, um, we're going to go through how to make a comment again um, after tonight, and then we'll also go who to contact, go through who to contact if additional questions come up. So I'm still not seeing any raised hands. So what we'll do is we'll move on to that next part of the evening. So um, Mike, if you wouldn't mind uh, reading the closing statement for us tonight. All right. Uh, thank you for your comments and cooperation. Uh, we appreciate your interest in the proposed project and that you took the time to be here tonight. So uh, as indicated at the beginning of the hearing, you may submit additional written comments until July 15th of 2023. Um, following the close of the public comment period, we will consider all comments received and make a decision on the proposed project. Uh, just to remind those that may still want to submit a comment, uh, comments can be submitted via my Enviro portal, uh, email, or by U.S. mail. So the hearing is now closed, and thanks again. All right. Thank you, Michael. Um, yeah, as Michael said, other ways to submit an official comment through my Enviro, uh, the submission number HPM56M2CJC9G, and at this link, which was put in the chat again, 
And then by mail, Eagle Water Resources Division, the Lansing District Office, 525 West Elegant Street, P.O. Box 30473, Lansing, Michigan. Um, and that'll be open until July 15th. All right. And in case you have additional questions, here's the slide I promised. Uh, Michael Size, you can contact, who's the regional engineer at 989-619-4295 or at sizem at michigan.gov. And that's spelled out S-I-Z-E-M at Michigan, spelled out M-I-C-H-I-G-A-N dot gov. Or Lucas Trumbull, uh, with the, who is the Dam Safety Unit su Supervisor at 517-420-8923. Or at Trumbull L at Michigan.gov. And that's spelled T-R-U-M-B-L-E-L -L at M-I-C-H-I-G-A-N dot gov. And uh, Luke, uh, we're at the end of the evening here. I was just wondering if you had any closing comments for us. Sure. Thanks, Ryan. Um, and thanks, everyone, for taking the time out of the evening to participate in the informational session and ask questions or participate in the hearing and, and uh, provide a, uh, an oral statement. Um, uh, as Ryan indicated and, and Mike indicated, the, you know, the, the public comment period for written comments would be open for 10, 10 days following the hearing. So if you have comments that you'd want to uh, submit in writing, please, please do so. Eagle does read all of those comments. We do consider all those comments, follow up, um, and you know if it's if it's um, relevant to the project and and the statute that that we administer, we do uh, um, consider those comments um, when when making a final permit decision. So I encourage you, anyone who hasn't done so and wishes to do so, to to take advantage of that opportunity. And again, thanks everyone, you know, for for coming out tonight and and uh, sticking with us and. Um, please do feel free to reach out to Mike or myself if there's any follow-up questions. Yeah, many thanks, Luke. Yeah, thanks to all of our panelists and everybody who uh, participated in this hearing. Um, and just my last thing is just a reminder that um, the recording of this hearing will be on our YouTube channel here in a couple of days, so you can view it again um, at your leisure if you want or forward it on to someone else. It'll be available. So with that, I hope you all have a rest of your evening. Thanks a lot.